On April 4th, a chemical weapon attack occurred in Khan Shikun, Idlib, Syria, killing at least 69 people. Western governments and media outlets have almost universally blamed the Bashar al-Assad regime for the attacks, while Russia and the Syrian government have blamed Syrian rebel forces. U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley indicated on April 5th that the U.S. may take action against Assad in response. On April 6th, President Donald Trump ordered a strike of 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles against Sherat Military Airport in Homs Province, the place that U.S. intelligence alleges as the point of origin for the chemical weapon attack. Fourteen observations on these events follow. 1. How people die is apparently more important than how many die. A person who dies convulsing and gasping for air following a sarin gas attack is just as dead as a person who is killed with bullets, conventional bombs, fire, or any other weapon of war. But the former looks more horrifying and thus causes more of an emotional response in empathic people than videos of bombed-out buildings or machine-gunned corpses. 2. The Lügenpresse is fully aware of this tendency. This is why both sensationalist journalists and propagandists for Western military intervention would rather show videos of this sort than videos of more conventional warfare and its results. This allows them to short-circuit the reason centers of the American people and appeal to their moral outrage in a selective fashion as Western countries tend to restrict their chemical weapons usage to less lethal levels, such as using tear gas against protesters. 3. It makes no sense for Assad to have used chemical weapons, and every bit of sense for the rebels. In a speech on the night of April 6th, Trump claimed that there can be no dispute that Syria used banned chemical weapons, violated its obligations under the Chemical Weapons Convention, and ignored the urging of the UN Security Council. End quote. Military intelligence reports seem to confirm this, but this may be disputed on the grounds that both the United States government and the intelligence community have a long history of both incompetence and of lying to the American people. Furthermore, Assad was already holding his ground and gaining territory from the rebels, including the capture of the long-besieged city of Aleppo in December 2016. The use of chemical weapons by Assad's forces could only invite intervention against their cause, and the rebels must know this, giving them the incentive to perpetrate a false flag operation. Of course, this does not mean that Assad or one of his generals is not ultimately responsible, as assuming rational actors would be a fatal flaw in any analysis of events in the Middle East. But the incentives run counter to that scenario and favor a rebel use of chemical weapons. 4. There is a stronger national security interest in not intervening. In his speech, Trump said, it is in this vital national security interest of the United States to prevent and deter the spread and use of deadly chemical weapons, end quote. This is debatable, but even if true, larger concerns loom. On April 7th, Vladimir Safronkov, Russia's deputy UN envoy, said to the UN Security Council, we strongly condemn the illegitimate actions by the U.S. The consequences of this for regional and international stability could be extremely serious. End quote. Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev charged that the U.S. strikes were one step away from clashing with Russia's military. Russia's defense ministry responded to the attack by closing a communications line used to avoid accidental hostilities between American and Russian forces when U.S. warplanes attack ISIS forces that are in close proximity to Russian forces. A Russian missile frigate was deployed to the area from which the two U.S. destroyers fired missiles into Syria. None of this is beneficial for the fight against Islamic terrorism, and it makes a shooting war between nuclear-armed states far more likely. 5. Attacking Assad helps the Islamic State Following the cruise missile strike against Sherat, ISIS forces in Homs launched an offensive, storming the Syrian Arab army checkpoints near al furqalas The destruction of Sherat will temporarily prevent Assad's forces from providing air support in the area, which could lead to ISIS gains there as well as on the Palmyra and Deir Ezzor fronts. 
This is to be expected, a black swan event that negatively affects one side in a war necessarily has a positive effect on that side's enemies, and ISIS has enough sense to seize upon this opportunity. 6. Actions like this make it difficult to take the war on terrorism seriously. Attacking people who are at war with a terrorist state is counterproductive to winning the war on terrorism. In fact, it raises concerns that defeating terrorism is not the true purpose of the war on terrorism. Note that if the war on terrorism were won, then the rationale for police statism and massive military spending would vanish. If the war on terrorism were lost, then the state would fail at the one job that it is supposedly solely capable of performing, namely keeping its people safe. The ideology of Islamic terrorists disallows a draw, so the only other option is an endless war. An endless war allows politicians to continually expand state power and siphon money into the hands of the defense contractors who fund their campaigns. The idea that politicians care more about this than about the human lives lost on both sides of the conflict is the most cynical explanation, so it is the most likely to be correct. 7. The damage from the cruise missile strike can be easily repaired. Repairing a runway is a simple matter of bulldozing the affected areas and repaving it, which can be done in a few days. The buildings must be demolished and rebuilt, which could be done in a matter of weeks. Replacing the 20-plus aircraft that were destroyed is the hard part, but Russia can solve that problem for Assad. In short, this one strike will be quite ineffective in the long term. 8. Trump's moral outrage is inconsistent at best. The very strike that was supposed to stop civilian deaths actually contributed to them. Errant missiles missed the airbase, hitting nearby villages. Five adults and four children were killed in Al-Hamrat, and another seven people were wounded in Al-Manzul. A few weeks earlier, an airstrike aimed at ISIS in Mosul, Iraq, killed 200 civilians. It makes no sense for Trump to be outraged about chemical weapons use in Syria, but not about these atrocities carried out by the U.S. military under his own orders. 9. Given the previous six observations, the strike makes more sense as a cynical political move than as an effort to help the Syrian people or punish Assad. As tensions escalate with North Korea, a targeted strike against Syria makes the threat of a targeted strike against North Korea more credible. This may alter the calculus of Kim Jong-un as well as the Chinese government, leading North Korea to be less aggressive and China to be more cooperative. At home, Trump faces continued allegations of links between his campaign and Russian government officials, in addition to difficulties in accomplishing his legislative agenda. Acting against Syria while Russia is assisting them helps to rebut such allegations and give the appearance that he is not completely hamstrung by Congress. Trump may calculate that the number of isolationist supporters he would lose through such an act would be outweighed by the number of neoconservative and neoliberal war hawks he would win over. This combination of effects makes more sense as a motive than any humanitarian concerns. As for future action against Syria, removing Assad would further destabilize the region and create a power vacuum which would be filled by jihadists. This would distract Trump from the aspects of his agenda that run counter to the globalist deep state. Backing down and patching over relations with Russia in a timely manner would bolster the leftist narrative of Trump as a Russian puppet. We may therefore expect more targeted strikes which leave Assad in power and do not really accomplish much. 10. Statecraft requires rational psychopathy. The unpleasant truth that no one wishes to acknowledge is that allowing third world dictators to massacre their own citizens is the best thing we can do. As shocking as that may sound, there are only two alternatives, both of which have been tried and shown to be even worse. One alternative is to intervene decisively to help an oppressed people overthrow their ruler. This was tried in Iraq in 2003 and in Libya in 2011. The end result in both cases was sectarian violence that killed people at a faster rate than did the deposed dictators. 
and the same sorts of human rights abuses continued under new leadership. The other alternative is to intervene indecisively to keep a civil war raging. This was tried in Iraq and Syria in and after 2011. The end result has been the weakening of social order, the marginalization of moderate rebel groups, the growth of jihadist terror groups, and the ultimate transfer of arms to Al-Qaeda, Islamic State, and their affiliates. The President of the United States, so long as there is going to be one, should be a person completely lacking in empathy. One should instead govern as a perfectly rational psychopath, thinking completely with the head and not at all with the heart, looking out for the interests of Americans and not for the interests of foreigners. One must be able to look at overseas atrocities and say, this is not our problem. We are not the policemen of the world. 11. This situation is the result of Western meddling. Syria was a colony of France from 1920 to 1946. At the beginning of this time, mandatory Syria was divided into six states. Greater Lebanon, now Lebanon, Sanjak of Alexandretta, now part of Turkey, the state of Aleppo, the state of Damascus, the Alawite state, and the Jabal al-Druz state. This arrangement kept opposing factions in their own territories, but France had combined the latter four by the end of 1936. These factions fought for control, resulting in a large number of military coups and attempted coups from 1945 to 1970, ending only when Hafez al-Assad was able to rule strongly enough to suppress dissent. After his death in 2000, his son Bashar succeeded him. In the Arab Spring protests of 2011, Assad's rule was challenged by various factions which sought to remove him from power, leading to the Syrian civil war. 12. Syria must balkanize. If France had not tried to combine disparate peoples under one state, and had instead left the four Syrian states separate, this bloody conflict could have been prevented. Bashar al-Assad, if he had come to power at all in this alternate timeline, would only be the ruler of a small part of western Syria. The rest of the country would have been ruled more locally, and probably less oppressively by governments of their own people. This, rather than the removal of Assad followed by yet another wasteful failure of nation-building, should be the end goal of any intervention that might occur in Syria. 13. Trump has betrayed the raison d'etre of his campaign, a major factor that caused people who normally do not vote for anyone to come out to vote for Trump was his America First rhetoric. Part of putting America first is to avoid unnecessary foreign entanglements by implementing a non-interventionist foreign policy. Many people supported Barack Obama in the hopes that he would do less damage overseas than George W. Bush. After being disappointed in Obama and seeing no difference in Mitt Romney, they gravitated toward Trump because his rhetoric was in stark contrast to that of establishment politicians from both major parties. Now he has also disappointed them, and hopefully they will come to realize that 14. Peace can only be obtained by anti-political means. Peace is the status of being free from violence. A state is a group of people who exercise a monopoly on initiatory force in a certain geographical area. Initiatory force involves the use of violence. Thus, the very presence of a state is a guarantee of war, both abroad and against the domestic population at home. Therefore, the only possibility for peace is to have no state. The elimination of the state cannot be accomplished by political means, as political processes perpetuate the state by design. Thus, anti-political means are required.